came up and down accounts looking like lost and found thought about selling dope and pounds dc's keep my feet on the ground low key old d on the counts enemies appoint me to drag can't keep we are back uh i'm super excited for uh this very special episode um man i got a, a mentor uh a big brother on the show um someone who i i text repeatedly um <laughs> Man, Jamal Bernard, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Let me apologize for not Don't do that. to every text. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> no, nah, man, I, I, I'm do doing that. good. I, 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 I appreciate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm excited, man. I, I, I've been wanting to have this conversation for a while now just because uh, you, you come from where I come from um, and I come from where you come from. We grew up in the same neighborhood, yep. you know, uh, even though the ages are different. Uh, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot older than you. <laughs> You my know. man, <laughs> but uh, no. Even though the ages are different, we grew up in 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 the same neighborhood, mm-hmm. and I just know how tough it was for me. Um, so that's where I kind of want to start. Um, how was it growing up for you? You know, where where do you come from? How was it growing up for you? And uh, I guess talk about that. You know, family legacy for a little bit. Yeah, I, th- I think you know, growing up in Williamsburg, as you know. You know, it wasn't the Williamsburg that they have now. No. Right? I, I told people I learned about crack vials and prostitutes before I learned how to ride my bike without training wheels. You know, that's how it, 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 was, it, was, it was going, you know, junkyard dogs roaming the streets. You got to yeah. make sure you get into a certain time because you don't know what's going to happen out there uh, between the gangs and, and all this other stuff. It, it was crazy. It was crazy. But it created, you know, this Jamal that you're seeing yeah. here. And I... I, I Appreciate it, but then I also upset because as I experienced this different quality of life, right. I said, "Man, this is what I wish I experienced younger." Yeah. And but now, thank God, my kids are able to experience a different quality of life. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. For me, growing up, uh, I feel like I didn't have my first job till I was like real job until I was like eighteen, nineteen. Well, and I grew up in the projects, right? So we only knew our like four block radius, mm-hmm. right? That was our world. Anything outside of that, you know, you didn't go up to the south side, you didn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was our world. Um, that's where we we shopped for clothes. That's where we ate. That's where we did life. Um, and I remember my first job in the city. It was like a whole new world for me, you know. And I would I would meet younger people, and and their experiences were nothing like mine. Um, and I remember being a, a a bit jealous and a bit upset about it. Like, oh man, like even though for me, I feel like I lived the life, right? <laughs> yeah, but we had we had a different life. We had some fun. Yeah. Like growing up in the street, there was there's something that you cannot uh, regret. Yeah. You know, there's certain aspects because there's certain things that we talk about to this day, and people are like, no, I never did that. Are you, no, you never played this game. No, I never played that game. No, you know? no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what I'm, that's what I'm leaning towards because. I cherish how I grew up, and and the, it's made me the person I am today. Um, but I would be lying if I said, like, there are habits that I grew up with, or even a mentality I grew up with that I was. I feel like I was forced to have mm-hmm. because of the circumstance, yeah. because of the situation. I guess can you talk on that a bit, as far as like where you are now and how you were back then? Well, I, I think anybody that grew up in the hood can attest to this that. Our level of trust is, is is different, yeah, right. Because one, you know, and and I think this is where it it hurts us, but it protected us more than it hurt us, yeah, right. Because we we can there's a street smarts that we get that a group of individuals can never say they have, yeah, that's uh, a fact. you know, because we can see something like now nah, we need to move, like, and then you you're talking to somebody you're like, wow, what happened? Like, we just need to go. Right now, because you know, we, we learn to keep our head on a swivel. Yeah, we learn to start reading body language early. Right, these are certain skills that we we uh, learn how to acquire in order for our safety, in order yeah. for survival. Right? right, we learn how to read. You know, a certain body's body language. We learn how to talk a certain way. We we walk with a certain level of of um uh how do you say it? a certain level of of um strength courage yeah, yeah, yeah. right because it, it it was it wasn't really to uh be arrogant about it but no I, I, in order for me to make it home right through certain blocks in the neighborhood i had to you know i had to walk a certain way right. so you know because you didn't want to be a victim right, you know, right, right. And, and too often people walk 
Uh, and 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 they, they wonder why they get they get victimized, right? But that's a different podcast. We'll talk about that another yeah. time. But uh, but yeah, but then on the other end, it hurt because you know think about it. How many how many times we had a hard time trusting certain individuals, especially if they're too nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started going around certain communities. I'm like, okay, this is awkward. Like, it made me feel awkward when I started dealing with people that's too nice because too nice in the, in the hood is like they wanted something. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Or you like, okay, something they, happened they behind scheming. me. Yeah, yeah, scheming, you know, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Where you get set up, they're scheming on you. <laughs> you know, and, and and what it did was it caused me to end up missing out on certain opportunities. Right. So I had to go through a rewiring and say, okay, what does Trusting looks like, but still being to protect myself. Yeah, and so that growth took me to another level uh, in life. Yeah, you know what? What what's tough about it is I definitely know the rewiring. The rewiring is definitely a thing. Yes, uh, especially when when I'm not I'm not trying to jump forward, but I remember when I got married and we moved to Queens, and just the neighborhood was so different. <laughs> like it was so quiet. Like I always felt, anytime I heard something outside, I'm like, nah, they they outside. Somebody's outside, <laughs> and she's like, nah, no one's outside. Like you're good, <laughs> you're good, you know. Um, but you know, you talk about how we kind of had to develop certain skills, right? Grown now, being older, even though it it seems like okay, yeah, like we develop street street smarts and and all these things, but sometimes I can't help but think that, like. Man, like this, this is actually probably not a good thing because I feel like I grew up too fast. Yes. And I don't know if that worked, was the same for you, but I feel like I was making grown adult decisions at such a young age just to survive or just to figure out life. And, and I didn't, I don't know if that helped me with my, my psyche or my mentality as I got older. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, so. see, and, and I think that's where, you you start seeing the need for a, a wholesome, holistic household. Right. Because one of the things my dad did say, he said, look, I understand you're out there. He said, but don't grow up too fast. Yeah. Enjoy. And so he made sure that we enjoyed certain stages of life. Yeah. Uh, even though uh, economically we didn't have, you know, we didn't have it, uh, you know, you know, the, the, our family structure was not the same. So, you know, we, we would go to school and they say, well, write, write, a, write a report of your summer. And I'm like, y'all was running the streets, playing manhunt, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, football, you know, <laughs> you know, manhole to manhole, uh, you know, and and then you got the other kids uh, say, oh, I, I went to go, go visit my grandmother in Florida. We swam in the pool, I'm like swam in the pool. That we were at McCarran Park Metropolitan Pool, trying to, you know, hopefully that there was no, it wasn't shut down because it wasn't clean, right? That's good. But you know, so but my dad made sure that. Uh, you know, he kept us grounded in every stage from childhood yeah. to adolescence. And I think that's what, what, what helped me not become so cold and uh, have to grow up too fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you spoke about your dad, and I guess we can transition. Uh, growing up for me, man, I lost my dad at a young age. So it was very different for me growing up because I felt like I had to... Well, thank God, I, you know, I had an older brother, so I had to... He had to grow up fast because he had to take care of me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he had to, like, quickly make mistake, mistakes in order to kind of teach me certain things. But um, I guess how was that seeing your friends, like, possibly grow up with you but still grow up different? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, and going back to my dad, I, and that's what he had to go through. Remember, when he was born, his father rejected him. He was born in Panama, and, it, you know, his mother was uh, got, got pregnant at a young age, not married. So it was shame. Remember, Catholic background, you know, shame was a thing. And they shipped her up to New York from Panama. And he didn't have a father, so he had to grow up fast. Yeah. Grow up, you know, and he didn't want us to go through it. And then what happened was, I think it created a heart in him to accept our friends. Mm. And what we did was, you know, because some of the things, sometimes we don't realize, you know, at, at a certain age, but we're, we're looking to help individuals because it breaks our heart, you know, to right. see somebody go through something that, or experience something negative that they shouldn't be experiencing at such a young age. And we just open our doors. So those individuals, like you said, that right. grew up without a father, grew up, you know, different home type, you know, uh, home setup and things like that. Uh, we, you know, come come with us. So we ended up having people either move in for a certain amount of time, living with us. We had individuals, um, you know, th that 
we were hung out all the time. Like our door is always open. My mother, to the point where my mother said, is such and such coming over because, you know, we, we, he knows what time dinner is. You know, and <laughs> yeah. I, I, so I think uh, it, it, that's where it started my love to help people, my desire to, to engage individuals and say, yeah. you know, trying to, and I didn't want to become, because sometimes we end up becoming or creating a mentality, a savior mentality. Yeah. And I'm not Superman. Right. Right. And I can, we, we don't, the, the, Financially, we just can't help everybody. But it was fun uh, because, one, our house was never quiet. Two, you know, we always had, you know, a, a crew with us. So right. that made, you know, being out on the streets easier because there's always you know, 10, 12 of us always just there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember one one time this guy came to the house and told me he wanted to fight. So we all poured out of the house. And it was like 15 of us. And the, and the guy was like, oh, um, yeah, I just have a problem with just him and pointing to one of my mans. And, and my dad was like, all right, shoot a fair one on one. But if anything happens, you, you, you know, it's going to be on. So, it, but it was just, it's, it's, it's situations like that, that we, that helped us grow up in the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like, do you feel like there's still like certain uh, mentalities that you have now from like back then or a certain way of thinking when it comes to, I guess to like moving now, or do you feel like you're kind of that's kind of like wa- washed away at this point? Nah, yeah, you, know, you grow up in the hood. You never, you never leave certain habits. You know, you might turn them off and on depending yeah. on where you are, depending on what, you know what community, what environment you're in. But you know, you you know that at, at certain times and nights, you know, it just it clicks on. You know, I, I laugh at my wife. She grew up in Long Island. Right? Okay. I grew up in Brooklyn, so we we're married. I come home, I lock down everything. You know, but she's the one. She leaves. You know, she comes in the house rushing. She one time she left the keys in the door, so I come home one o'clock at night. You know, because we're doing something at church. It, it lasted late, and I I go. I'm like, girl, the keys are in the door. She said, I was looking for those. I'm like, different mentalities. You know, so yeah, certain yeah, things yeah. we we never switch off. Certain things we switch off and on. Uh, you know, even I know you growing up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I tell you this when I when I first got married, uh, we we lived in like. Uh, our first apartment was in Queens. We had like it was like, two doors you walked in through, and then your our apartment. And I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking at my door, and I'm like, Nah, I could bust this door. This is weak. I need, <laughs> yeah. I, I need to, I need to, I need to padlock this. I need to, I need to make yeah. this stronger. And she was like, I don't think you could do that with this door. I was like, I can break this door. If I can break it, someone can break it. And I remember this is how bad it was. I remember this is how bad it was. We put a, well, I put like a little bell at my door. So if I knew somebody was going to come in, mm-hmm. at least the bell would ring and I would hear it. But I guess that's how I was mm-hmm. because I knew in the projects, we had like the padlock, we had the sliding joint, we yeah, had everything. Had the bar on the floor. Yeah. Right into oh, the door. man, it yes. was a mess. But and at the same time, I knew what I used to do. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, well, if I did it, yep. you know what I mean? Someone's going to do it yep. too. You know what I mean? Um, but I guess talk about, I guess, growing up, you said, you know, your love for people came and, and, and your love for like helping people and just being there and caring for people. Um was that the result of the church or was that just the result of just how your family was or was it a mix or like, when did you know? Cause I, obviously your dad, we all know who your dad mm-hmm. is and, and, and he's like such an important figure, especially in today's society. And probably even back then too. Like I felt like I've, I've, I've heard his name growing up since I was a kid. Um, was it almost like, what was your experience like though? What was it for you? Because, Obviously, your dad can tell you, but you, mm-hmm. you're you saying you also felt it as well. Yeah. So I, what was that like? I think it, 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 it's na- it was natural for us. We, you okay. Know, we, we're, we're, people say that we're people, people, person. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, So like we were we were on vacation, and next thing you know, by the end of the night, everybody wanted to hang out with you know, me and my family, talking and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> one person asked me, what, what sport do I play? I said, oh, no, this, this is all intimidation because I have daughters, right? <laughs> so they all started laughing. Uh, but I think naturally, I, uh, I'm a people person. I love right. to interact and hang out with people. And uh, and that's why I love the way my dad operated because he's not. Right. Dad's ex- you know, he's strictly an introvert, right? He, an introvert that loves people. Yeah, but yeah, He's yeah. the guy, he'll go to movies by himself. I'm like, for real? I know, he'll, I know people like yeah, that. Yeah, that's my dad. He'll, 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 he'll go to a restaurant, eat dinner by himself. 
Yeah. Like, and I, I need to talk to somebody. I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but he accepted that. And he adjusted the way he operated, functioned, in order to do that. So, like, even my brother, Fonzo, you know, uh, the one who passed in 2015, he just, people just gravitated to, to him. And that was the norm. It was just something that we did, you know. So I don't, I wouldn't give it credit to the church. Yeah. I, I would credit the church and a lot, you know, creating a lens that my father saw it through mm. and didn't reject it and say, nope, this is my house. You know, and he, he allowed us to flourish. Yeah. And that, that, that nature, the natural way of living that we, we created. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel that, um, do you feel like growing up, it, it, it was, it was easier because those, I guess, those things were put into place. You know what I mean? Like, was it easier? So for me, growing up, I didn't, I didn't have that. You know yeah. what I mean? I didn't have. It was just literally me and my brother, and we were just trying to make it out or try to figure it out. You know what? What does the next day look like? Would you see some of your friends who necessarily didn't have that, and they would come to your house? I guess talk about if I transition a question. How talk about how how hard was it, even though you growing up the way you did and with the things that was instilled in you and the way your family was, you know, it wasn't like that for some of your friends. No, it wasn't. You know what I mean? And I guess talk about that. How how was that feeling like? You know what I mean? I, I think I, I, I felt bad, right? Yeah. I felt bad. I, 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 saw, I, get, I got a little self-conscious. Uh, okay. Yeah, because I, I felt like, you know... Um, I had something special, mm. and you know, and and and, and I didn't want to to push in somebody's face because I talked about my, my my parents a lot, my dad, uh, you know, and so I, I became very self conscious and and knowing that that's not everybody's uh, narrative, that's not everybody's uh, reality. Right. Uh, so it kind of um, caused me to not really appreciate it because I, I was so self conscious, and I, and I think I neglected the fact that this is what I had, mm. um, you know, because. Uh, I, it was to me. We started becoming a negative. Yeah. Right. Oh, you got your father at home. And, you know. And, you know. You, you know. You know. Growing up, you know, there's always jokes, right? And in the back of my head, I was like, okay, wow, um, this is not the norm for a lot of uh, individuals. And because it became so self conscious, it became a negative. You know, where I looked at it and say, wow, um, is is this? You know, this is no longer fun, right? At one right. point. Because of the 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 fact is, I have something special. You don't have it, and I feel bad that I have it now. Yeah, you know. And as I grow up and mature, it, 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 the lens changed. Yeah, and I started saying, "No, I thank God I have this. Yeah, right? I thank yeah. God. You know, I'm sorry that you don't have this." And the the awareness and appreciation increase at a more mature age. And I think that if I I, I, I if I would have been able to appreciate it a lot more, there would have been a lot more different memories, better memories yeah. growing up in the house. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I love that. Um, do you feel like the person you are today, do you feel like you regret anything from, I guess, like your childhood or decisions you could have possibly made or like different? So, for example... Uh, I think it's best for me to always like share, right? And, and put it into my perspective, especially when we're, where we grew up. Um, you know, just growing up in my household, my mom, uh, uh, she's going to hate me for saying this, but it's the truth. You know what I mean? She was a believer, but she was the type that would like not let you go away to college mm. because she, she felt like you were going to get like corrupt. You know what I mean? And I felt like I missed out on a lot of life because of it you know what i mean i missed out on like you know football teams and i missed out on like going away to college i had like two three scholarships you know what i mean but because they were away i, I didn't take them Damn. you know what i mean and i'm like man like the mentality was so strong back then of just trying to like not allow yourself to to be damaged by mm -hmm. this crazy society yeah. that was back then and now i think about it i'm like Man, like, <laughs> I, you know, I, I do pray for schooling, man. I, I, I One day I hope to get that. But uh, I guess, do you have any of those kind of, like, regrets or 
Was it more like, you know, you were able to kind of be your full self and and experience what you wanted to experience, whether, you know, your dad was going down one path and you was like, you know what, maybe I want to try this for a mm-hmm. bit. Like, how was that for you? Well, I, I, that's a great question. You know, and, and as you, you, you asked that, I'm thinking it was, I think the biggest regret um, was not being able to experience things earlier in life. Okay. Right? So I, I, I played sports. Not, I didn't play sports until I got into um, high school. Oh, wow. Right? Because, you know, in the na- we didn't have peewees in the neighborhood. You had to go to another neighborhood to, to join. If you joined, it was, you know, you had to pay for it. Yeah. And then my dad was like, we don't have the money for it. So, you know, you can't play it. Um, you know, we, we so I, my experience, stuff that people experience, even in the hood, I didn't even experience that. The only football we played was on the street. Wait, cars come in, hold on. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then when you know, it snowed, that's when you added some tackle football. But um, not into high school was I able to experience sports. And I think if I would experience sports uh, earlier, yeah, I would have went into sports a little further. Yeah, uh, you know, I would have really pushed to play in college. Uh, I got registered my first year, and um, I, I thank God I didn't go away though, because yeah. I would have been that guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Man, I'm, I'm, so I'm my mother was school. right. No, yes, I'm no, no. <laughs> For me, yeah. I, like, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I was partying, hanging out. We were Howard Homecoming. We were at Freaknik. We were at, you know, you name it, Greek Fest. We, you know, we were up and yeah. down the East Coast. Like I got so many incompletes my first semester. It was, it was bad. And I'm like, and this is me being in school locally. Like I was, I went to Hofstra University, so I was right there. And um. It was it, it was it was good. I I didn't go away to school. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think that's my biggest regret is not being able to engage in organized sports earlier in my life. Yeah, and I know we had some conversations like off camera, and I, we've had this conversation before. Um, but now you know you're a father, right? Uh, and you have a couple kids, and do you kind of how does how does that do you kind of tell them? what you've been through and how you grew up that way they can kind of appreciate what they have now or do you just kind of like make sure that they have every opportunity to have everything uh kind of like laid out for them like how does it i guess how does it work for you being a father Mm -hmm. um growing up the way you did and now saying okay i want to do this different or i want to be able to provide uh, how are those conversations, I guess, with your kids? Oh, well, yeah, I, t- I talked about where we come from and, you know, because I want to make sure that they appreciate yeah, yeah. what they have, um, you know, and as well as I, 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 I make sure that they understand the power of no, right? I don't give them everything. I don't want to, I don't, because I, I want to spoil my kids, but I don't want to create brats, right? It's different between being a, a spoiled kid and then being a spoiled brat. And, I wanted to be able to afford them as much as as possible earlier in life, yeah. you know, compared to where I was able to access. So I had my kids in you know little soccer league at four years old. You know, if you want to play soccer, let's try. If you want to play an instrument, let's try. Whatever you want to do, uh, even to a point where now my son and I, he's uh, fourteen. He's like, I don't want to play sports, but I said, all right, what do you want to do? He said he wants to go to the gym. So now him and I take that time, and that's me and his time, yeah, yeah. working out, spending time together, encouraging him, you know. And so we try to uh, give them as much as possible without corrupting them. Yeah. Uh, because I don't want to go to an extreme, because anything taken to the extreme is error. Right, right, right. right? Or becomes error. And I don't want to be an extreme and give them everything. I'm like, no, you can't have this right now. Right, right. Right, right. you know? And to the point where, like, Daddy, is it, is it financially difficult? No, it's not about the finances. It's just we can't have it right now. Yeah. Right? You know, you need to build up to it. You need, this needs some, to be some earning, earning a part of it, keeping your room clean, you know, doing your chores, doing everything you need to do in order to achieve this. You know, it's, it's just not going to be handed to you yeah. just because you asked for it because that's not how uh, real life works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in, in today's society, uh, a lot of dads are taking steps to be very, a lot more transparent with their kids or with just family around mm-hmm. them. Um, and I love it. I love, it's like a, like a resurgence of, <laughs> of honoring dads. I yeah. love, I love it. Um, but I feel like dads still lack vulnerability. Why is that? Well, I, I think being able to be vulnerable and transparent is determined by the maturity of the one you're being vulnerable and transparent in front of. Yeah. Right. So my one daughter is 21. I can, she can receive certain things. Right, uh, and and hear certain things and see certain things with dad, where my five year old can't see it. 
Yeah. Right? She's not mature enough. She can't, she doesn't have the mind to understand everything that's going on. I so I think, you know, that puts a limitation on the vulnerability. I think also, and this is the biggest thing, is uh where does vulnerability stop and weakness starts? Mm. Right? Where does vulnerability starts and we uh, stops and weakness starts? Because for a lot of men, being too vulnerable means being coming you looked at as being weak. Right, because vulnerability is saying no. I, I cried the other day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, does that make me look weak now? Uh, no, I was struggling. I, I had, you know, I, I was, I was dealing with certain things. You know, I didn't know if I, I would, I, I could make it through today, right? You know, that's that's the vulnerability you're talking about. But um, the other, so so I think you know the maturity of the person, um, the where does vulnerability stop and you know, weakness starts, right? Because I think too vulnerable, you, you are being, you know, now you're showing too much and that is, a, you're definitely going into showing yourself weak as a, a man. And we have to have a certain strength because yeah. the biggest thing is you don't want your vulnerability to lead you to a place where people can't find security in you. Ah, uh, okay. Right? Uh, and and people need, like your wife, you know, she seeks security, meaning, you know, I mean, not meaning, but security, uh, strength in, 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 in a man, you know? And, and yeah. my, I don't want my wife, I come home, my wife's like, yo, you out there <laughs> looking like a you know a weak guy. You know yeah. I need to show myself strong, but the reality is that being vulnerable is showing a certain level of strength. Yeah. Right. So it, it, it's so it's it's, the, it's a little paradoxical yeah. with trying to be vulnerable, showing strength, and not showing weakness. I think a lot of guys don't know how to get, navigate that. Yeah. So they rather it's tough. yeah they rather they rather not risk it in order to yeah. uh, stay looking strong. I also don't know. I also feel like. It's not shown as much either. Like there, there isn't, there wasn't a blueprint on how to be transparent nope. or vulnerable. I think it just started happening, mm -hmm. and it just started kind of, you know, becoming a thing. Yeah, like my dad. My dad would not is not as vulnerable and transparent as I am. No, you know, especially growing up without a father and stuff like that. Especially him, you know, growing up in the sixties and the streets and stuff like that. They were doing some other stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, they, I don't think transparency and vulnerability was allowed. Like you had to be a stone wall. Like you know? yeah, yeah. Sorry for cutting you off. No, no, no. But but see, that's the thing too. I feel like you know, and I'm not I'm not taking a shot at your dad. So <laughs> you don't gotta you don't gotta beat me up. No, nah. <laughs> but you know, a lot of our our fathers mm -hmm. and our fathers' fathers, there was such a stone wall that creating that passing down that wall mm -hmm. and not so for example i would you know i would talk to my dad about things but he wouldn't share his experience it mm -hmm. was almost like a like a don't do that because you're gonna get hurt yeah but you're not sharing with me like your process of mm -hmm. how you know you know what i mean like wait how do you know i'm gonna get hurt yeah. oh wait it, you you got hurt too Tell me about mm -hmm. that. I kind of want to know why. So it, it led me to saying like, oh, well, I'm, I just want to see why I'm going to get hurt. You know what I mean? So f for you, you know, you spoke about your dad a bit and, and how he was. Being a public figure that you are, right? Um, uh, I don't know if you label yourself that, but, you know, for, for us, you know, you are, right? Um, do you struggle with being vulnerable with people? It depends. Um if the the um, yeah, I, I think all of us struggle because you know you, you're you're worried about um, what people are gonna say. Yeah, you know what people can I trust you? You know, um, when I'm preaching, I, I show a little bit of transparency, but I, don't, I I give enough details so people can understand the experience, but not too much. Yeah, you know, so I say you know if like if me and my wife we were arguing, I don't tell them. You know specifically why we're arguing, but I, I'm vulnerable enough to let them know. Look, you know, not me. When my wife argues, you know, we we go through like you know, you know I, we don't have the Stepford wife set up. You know, my wife didn't say yes, whatever you want. No, <laughs> you know, she she challenges me to make sure that I, I mature in life. But I think it depends on who it is. But it it is sometimes difficult to be vulnerable, uh, more so because not to sh not not to show you know weakness, but you know, is my dirt gonna be out there? Yeah. Right. Because part of vulnerability is you know sharing some of your dirt, sharing some of your your mistakes, your your, your humanity, your brokenness, yeah. and your woundedness, and uh, especially in front of certain pastors, because uh, you know, I don't I don't want to be you know being preached about, you know the next Sunday. You know, I can't I can't you can't trust all these pastors. Yeah, you know, I'm a pastor myself, and I'm saying that. Right. And because you know it, I think your 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 um, le level of vulnerability I think is, is based on how much you believe the person loves you. Yeah. You know, like I know that you got you you got that love for your, for your brother over here, 
And, you know, so I can share with you certain things that I won't share with, you know, uh, other individuals. Yeah. Certain things I'll share with you that I won't even share with my my, my, my kids, my family. Right. Um, because I believe, I, I trust that we can have these uh, moments of vulnerability. But it's, it's difficult. You know, I, I think as a man, uh, until it becomes the, the norm uh, of the culture, the norm of, of, of society, being a vulnerable is going to be still a tough thing. Yeah. I, I, for me, the way I see... Uh, transparency is like uh, like for me transparency is sharing about myself right mm-hmm. but being vulnerable is allowing me allowing someone to to speak in to yes. what that is yep, it you is. know what I mean it is. Um, and I feel like a lot of people aren't ready for that mm-hmm. part of it um, but I feel like there's a lot of a lot of ways that we're getting there you know mm-hmm. what I mean so I'm excited for that especially as as dads and as men you know we, we're it slowly but surely, I feel like that conversation is now happening. Yeah, again. yeah, you know I agree. I, mean? I agree. Even even good f- with the half hour. Oh, you just you just restarted it. Okay, was it was it in between something or no? Yeah. But you think you got cut off? Or I gotta do it again. All right, cool. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna take five seconds and restart again. Okay. You yeah. you could just go with whatever you were about okay. to just say. Mm-hmm. Even with you, like grow up in it. I think. You know, like we said, you grow up in a hood, right? There's just not only just you know being a man uh, issues, but grow up in a hood. You, you know, we were like, we can't be vulnerable, we can't be you know, yeah. too transparent. Growing up in because <laughs> you 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 because remember, you know, you, you you're vulnerable. Does that somebody does that person see a sign of weakness? Right. And if they do see it as a sign of weakness, are they going to exploit it? Right. 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 And so there's certain there's so many variables that leads up to us being it, it difficult for us to be vulnerable. As men. Yeah, yeah. I think, so the beginning of the, and I've told the story a bunch of times, but I guess for context, right? The beginning of 2020, um, I struggled. And I think I told you this mm-hmm. before when we, I, I struggled with my, like my mental health and stuff like that. But I think once I started seeing a therapist and once I started kind of like talking, for me, going to therapy has been the best thing because I can sit down and tell my therapist everything and they're not a part of my family or my circle. Mm-hmm. So they get to hold all that baggage and I kind of get, get to go home. Yep. Um, but I was able to start to be more transparent with my wife and be vulnerable with my wife and just people around me and wanting to kind of have the conversation. So I guess how important is mental health for you? Uh, mental health is very, very important, I think, because uh, mental health, will uh, the lack of mental health creates a, a, an unhealthy, you know, um, it can create unhealthy relationships. Mental health, uh, lack of good mental health can create um, uh Unhealthy work ethics. Uh, it can. It's just so. There's so many different things that can come out of an unhealthy mental health. Um, and I think mental health is necessary, especially if we want to um, move past and become better individuals. That you know, because one of the questions you had asked was about success. Yeah. I think you know when it comes to mental health, I, you, you it, it helps you become more successful. Yeah, yeah. Right, because there's certain things that. Uh, become triggers that cause you not to do certain things or, or or respond to certain things because of some trauma that you have experienced before. Yeah. And that trigger and trauma not resolved can hold you back from being able to step into something that you can possibly do. Yeah. Right? And I think mental health is necessary, especially as a man. You know, for, for women, it's very, it's very... But as a man, I think uh, mental health is so needed in, in fathering... Yeah. Individuals, because if you don't, you can actually pass down some of those traumas. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can you can hinder and hold back some of your kids yeah. from doing certain things. So it's like so you got that parent that um, you know, doesn't allow the kid to do the X, right? Because of what they experienced. And you can't do this, no, you can't do this, you can't do this. And the very thing that they say they can't do is the very thing that's gonna uh, release them to become successful individuals. Right. But because of their trauma and lack of mental health. They didn't, you know, walk walk them through it, right. and you know. So when we are there dealing with trauma, we are not equipping ourselves to help somebody come up behind that's coming up behind us to yeah. walk through a possible similar situation yeah. because we're still dealing with it, right? Right. So now I got my kids, and they're experiencing life, and this, you know, so now they might have a traumatic experience. I'm dealing with the same traumatic experience. I can't help them. I clam up, and next thing you know, they, they go down a spiral of negative decisions and things like that, all because I didn't deal with my own trauma and yeah. mental health. Yeah. 
being being the pastor that you are um in in a in a very like well known church is mental health something that you guys have been pushing or is mm-hmm. something like you're jumping on the forefront of it now or like how's that conversation about mental health in the church I think we've been pushing it um I think uh as you know the need has a uh increased we have increased our conversations about it. We just, last Sunday, we just did a seven-minute piece with a psychiatrist, psychologist, talking about the need for mental health. And, and it's actually a, a part of a four-part series yes. for the month of May, because May is month, mental health uh, month. Yep. And so we're really, uh, and, and uh, because the, the irony is we can push physical therapy. We can have that. Everybody talks about physical therapy. Yeah. But mental therapy, right? You know, yeah. uh, emotional therapy, we don't push. It's like tabooish. And why is that tabooish? Because, you know, it, it is like, once again, mental health is at a, another sign of weakness. It's another yeah. sign of, of distress, you know, and you know, a, a real man is not supposed to show his emotion. A real man is not supposed to, you know, be in distress. You know, you bottle it up, compartmentalize it, and move on with your life. And, yeah. and you know, that's, that's good for certain things. But that's not the, you know, the, the, the key for everything. Yeah. And so now we are increasing momentum on what we're doing, what we're talking about, even to the point where we're about to do a development. And on development, we're making sure that we have a mental health office to really engage the community, right? Yes. So like I said, I have a heart for people, and we're doing some stuff with the NYC. And one of the things is, you know, what can we do for the homeless uh, in, uh, groups of individuals yeah. in New York City? Most of the homeless people, yep, bad decisions, stuff like that, but if you talk to that, they said about 75% of homeless people is a, 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 a response to mental health. Yeah. You thought you would think it was drugs and stuff like that. No, it was the mental health that led them into the drugs. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's the mental health that led them into alcoholism. It's the mental, there's a lot of mental health that we don't talk about that is right. really hurting our society. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you talk about the development because I remember there was this one doctor on the news and he was kind of talking about, you know, uh, after we're kind of done with the COVID and the pandemic, that he believes mental health would increase by 200%. Is that something that you guys are kind of like now preparing yourselves for? Yes. Like from nowadays, you can talk to like the youngest person and they'll tell you like, oh, I'm depressed, I'm sad. You mm-hmm. see young people committing suicide at such a young age um, with what they're struggling with, whether it's bullying or this, that, and the third. Like, what are some of the ways you guys feel like you're going to be able or want to be able to tackle those things? Oh, well, like, like I said, one, uh, from a financial perspective, because that's the thing. We know that we need it. But once again, you know, it, it, the whole idea behind access, right, is, is what's hurting us. Right. Right. They, they used to say this old adage, you know, give, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, you feed him for a, life, a lifetime. That's a lie. Right. Well, let me not say it's a lie. That's too too harsh but that's it's, it's not accurate right because if i don't have access to certain things i still can't eat yeah right if i don't have access to the lake i still can't eat if i don't have access to you know the 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 the, the mental health issue you know areas i i so i won't be whole i, yeah. I still, my community will still be where it is because of all the mental health issues that's going on so we're, we, our goal is really say okay let's give access you know to these individuals who can't afford it you know yeah financially it, you know it, mental health like these sessions, as you you know, you're going through it. My daughter, you know, you know, anywhere from fifty to one hundred fifty dollars a session. Yeah, and, and it's like you know, I can, the average person can't afford it. You know, and that's living in, in the five boroughs, that's living in the hood and you know the urban community, and yet they know that they need it. Yeah. So what can we do to help them get it? And I think that's one of the elements that help change a community. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you said like the average person can't afford it, right? But I guess in in my circle of people, right. In my area of people, like I, I know a lot of sneakerheads, and we talk about mental health and we talk about therapy. I'm like, man, just give up a pair of shoes. Mm-hmm. Just don't buy a pair of shoes and just like pay for a session. It'll change your life. Like I promise you. And I think it's when I took that approach because I, I would let's be honest, I would mm-hmm. spend money on other things. You know, I make my feet look good or whatever the case <laughs> is. But I, I was struggling up here. But mm-hmm. it was like, you know what? If I can manage my money properly and not spend it on aggressively on on things that are kind of useless to to be honest and put it on things like that, I feel like so I think that's also that approach as well. Yeah, I agree. You but know what I mean? Even to get somebody to make that 
switch to rewire their brain. Yeah. You're doing a little bit of therapy because that a lot of that stems from a mental health issue. Yeah. Like the need to have to have this, right? And the, yeah. the, the what 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 are you doing that you have staying on staying online for X amount of hours in order to get the first peer? You know, there's something going on. Yeah, I don't see right? I don't do the Yeah, no, yeah. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. But uh and and I agree with you, but long is a lot of this stuff is long term. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. you know one session here, one session there. Right. So I I agree, you know, the, the first couple of sessions are affordable. But to really re- help rewire yeah. the brain. You gotta stay in there. Yeah. And, you gotta stay. And it's true though, because I feel like I didn't I didn't see the need or I saw the need. I didn't care about the importance until I had kids. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Until I realized like, wait, I could actually now pass a few of these traumatic traits onto them Mm -hmm. and then i remember seeing like certain things characteristics in my son and i'm like that's it his life is ruined (laughs) you know what i mean but it's not not the case obviously Mm -hmm. um so you know i always find it important to to find balance right and and whether it's like ministry or i'm doing a project or uh shoes or you know whatever it Mm -hmm. is pot like when it comes to being vulnerable with your family and being vulnerable with your church and just people around you, right? Uh, where do you find the balance? Like, what is the balance like for you? Oh, uh, wow. I, I, I don't even know if I fully balance in it correctly. Um, it's difficult. I think I, that's why, like, there's, there's some negatives of COVID, but there's some positive of COVID because I spent more time with my family during COVID, which was... You know, it's such a, a, a nice thing, but um, I, I I don't know if I found I have found the balance yet. Yeah, I'm searching for the balance because one one minute you think you have the balance, and as your kids grow older, there's, there's a different need of daddy. Right, right. Where before, yep, we had dinner together. You know, all we need is dinner and help with homework. You know, and stuff like that. But now it's like, no, I want to spend time with you now. Yeah, right now, you know, daddy daughter dates. You know, hanging out and doing stuff like that. So I think. Uh, uh, it depends on what stage of life my family is in will determine what amount of time I I need to spend with them. Yeah. And that's where I'm trying to balance it because, like I said, I got a 21-year-old and I got a 5-year-old. Yeah. Right? So I got a, a spectrum. And it's 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 difficult trying to find a balance. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm struggling. Yeah. We're trying to find a balance, but I'm trying to do the best I can. I think that's why I thank God for my wife um, because she helps me. And she's she's a voice. So, oh, you know, babe, you know, X, Y, Z is happening. Right. You know, I said, okay, I got to start going, trying to adjust my schedule. You know, Jamal, you missed, you know, th- this. Uh, I said, oh, man. All right, so I, I can't make sure I can miss another one. So I make sure I tell my assistant. I tell everybody I need to know. And this day is off you know, off limits. And right. I, so that's where you start creating um, certain systems in your life. Yeah. To help you stay balanced. And some people say, well, oh, that's not authentic. No, I think the authentic- authenticity is, is is really saying I need help. Yeah. Right? I think the, the authenticity is saying I can't, you know, I'm, I'm missing the mark. I got to create something to help me not miss the mark. You know? So I, either I try to do it the old school natural way where, oh, everything's on the front of my mind. You know, the reality is it can't be, right? Life is so fast paced now compared to 20 years ago. Yeah. That, you know, I just, I, I create a system and I think that's where authenticity is. Yeah. So, you know, I need my, my sister needs to know. We got to create a family calendar. I need my, you know, I tell my kids, just please remind me. This is, the daddy just got so much in his mind. I, I ask him for help. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, that's where I start showing some vulnerability. You no, know, daddy needs help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's where, you know, I start creating, you know, the system. But yeah, it's a struggle still. The, those days that you do, like those days on the calendar where you do, you know, have more family time or more you time mm-hmm. like is there a struggle to still kind of like shut your brain off or even shut your phone off to not do work or not like focus on tomorrow's task or something like that yeah it's difficult because when i'm at the quiet time my brain is able to rest that's why i start be- becoming creative yeah, yeah and so yeah, i yeah. did start coming i'm like oh let me call such and such oh what do you think about this and next you know it starts becoming work yeah yeah but yeah Come I over, think, let's plan it out. Come yeah, over. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the dinner, we get everything together. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's once again, that's another struggle where, where it really shutting my brain off, and um, to a point where my wife takes the phone and says, "Okay, give me," and she tells me to go. Yeah, and I go where this is my office. I, I'm in the backyard, depending on the nice weather, just barbecuing. And she takes my phone and says, "Nope, you're not doing this." Yeah, you know. So I, I, I get a little pad and I just write the stuff down as it comes to me, and then talk to the people about it later. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, the interesting thing, I feel like, uh, uh, I didn't, I don't, I don't, I haven't known you for such a long time, but I feel like I know so much of you already because, you know, uh, you have been super transparent and super vulnerable and, and just super honest. I don't know if it's because we kind of come from the same area. Well, I, or... I think, I, I think it's, uh, it, when you find good people, yeah. right. You it, it just, you, you, you're a good brother. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I, I appreciate you, you know, no matter what, you know, uh, you know, you've always been there. Yeah. You've always, you know, you set the tone of transparency I'm like, all right, this guy's trusting me that I can trust him, right? Yeah, and yeah. sometimes that's where you, 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 somebody needs to start the transparency and it, you, you, you see the change. But not only have you been transparent, you've also been vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, with me. And I think I, I, I take that as a sign of respect. I honor uh, and I don't take things for granted. One of the things my dad made sure is that he said, don't take things for granted. Make sure you take the moment uh, and understand the quality of things that's happening, right? right, right and right. you have, when you're being vulnerable, you're, you're giving me quality time now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and so I respect that, and so I say, you know, so it's been easy, and now we have quality time because we have quality time. We get to know each other like we we've been begging yeah, yeah, for yeah. life, you know. So it, yeah, no, I, I I definitely feel that, and and I guess what I was saying too is is as long like me seeing you right, whether it's at a conference or an event, it's it's interesting because a lot of people know you, and a lot of people know your dad, and a lot of people gravitate towards your dad, and and yo, can I guess just get like five minutes with your dad, and and I go straight to you like, <laughs> like yo, what's up? Yep. Like, and we just start chopping it up and chilling, you know, talking about ministry, being vulnerable, you know, being around your dad, kind of doing ministry with mm-hmm. your dad. Um, do you ever, I guess, talk about? Is there a need to be different from him, or how do you how do how do you feel? I guess do you feel like you're kind of in his shoes sometimes, or like how does how does that work for you when it comes to uh, you being you and then him being him? You know, because I feel like every time I see him, I'm gonna see you. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, so it's like how does that how does that transition work for you uh, when it comes to not necessarily being vulnerable or transparent, but being yourself? Yeah, that, that that was difficult, um, and I think if I didn't have mentors in my life to help me find myself, yeah, I would have strived to try to be like my dad. Yeah, right. And I think you know if if you if you have a, if you're secure in your identity and who you are, it's easier for you not to try to become somebody else, right? Mm-hmm. And, my, and and I think my dad played a big role, uh, in in um in this because he never expected me to be like him. He always said this is what he told me. He said, Jamal, my goal is to make you the best Jamal. That is possible. He said, not the best, you know, carbon copy of A.R. Bernard. Yeah, yeah. You know, he said, you know, this, the, the world only needed one A.R. Bernard. He said, M- me being here was based on a time and season. He said, you are going to be a part of a time and season, right, outside of A.R. Bernard. And you, and they need Jamar Bernard, not A.R. Bernard. Right. And I think with those conversations that he had and having other individuals appreciating me for who I am, yeah. I think that made it easier. But in the early stages, yeah, I thought I had to be my dad. Yeah, I thought I had to fill his shoes. And I'm looking, I'm like, yo, and, and, and the, 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 the level of feeling inadequate was crazy. You know, that, that's why I didn't, I didn't start preaching until later in life. I didn't really start preaching on, on, a, on a pulpit until I was in my, 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 my mid to late 20s. Wow. You know, and then even then, I I, I would I st- still would shy away from it. Like, if my dad was on the stage, I wouldn't want to be on the stage because I was worried that they wouldn't, they're going to want to hear Dr. Renard whenever I spoke. And so now I'm, I, when I get on stage, I say, hey, if y'all hear, hear Dr. Renard, he'll be here next week. So you get Jamal <laughs> Bernard now. <laughs> but it was a, a journey yeah. to get to that. I didn't start with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, f- I feel like... One of the one of the first times I met you, I, I wouldn't. I'm not gonna say the conversation, <laughs> but one of the first things I, and and we didn't. I didn't know you so that well either. And you were talking about like, yeah, no, nah, that's see, that's what my dad does different. And I was telling him like, we shouldn't be doing this. And I was like, <laughs> oh wow, like you really like talk about that. Is it is it tough with your dad being who he is? Like, like is it because of the love of what you're doing in ministry and the church? why you want to say, hey, wait, dad, let's do it. Let's let's see if we can do it this way. Or do you even call him dad? I don't know. Yeah, I call him pa- yeah, okay, daddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. dad. It depends on who we are in front of, pastor. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and and the, 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 see, growing up, right, this is, this is the problem of growing up in a big ministry, especially a successful ministry, because you think that everything you're doing is the best. Right. Right? And then as you start going and, and moving and seeing certain things, the people doing certain things, I'm like, 
wow, why, why are we not doing that? You know, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. So I started bringing the ideas to my dad. And what I noticed is that he did not shut down the ideas. He shut down my approach. Okay. Right? And so I had to start changing my approach and say, you know, because stop using words like this is better. You know, because it been better than those, you know, bad, right? And I'm like, right, you know, right, right. and I'm like, no, I got a new innovative way that we can respond to the people. And so I had to start approaching and bringing some of new ideas because he knew that, that you know, the, some of the ideas were outdated and, and, and needed to be updated. But like I said, he, his biggest problem was approach. So when I used to go to my dad, I'm like, why are we doing that? That doesn't make no sense. You know, and I'm like, I have to realize, no, that was his idea. So what I'm saying is his idea didn't make sense. Yeah. You know, and yeah, but I, I challenged it because if you don't challenge what's going on, right, you won't grow. Yeah. Right. And and, and the reality is people only think to the level they're exposed to. Mm. And so as I started ex- being exposed to better, newer things, newer ideas, stuff like that, and bringing them to the church, my dad had this one set of ideas that he used to operate. It worked for him. Yeah. Right. But the reality is it's not going to work for the next generation. Yeah. So how do we present that? But yeah, I used to. Like, I used to get I used to get in trouble, you know. I had jokes, and and then that's one of the things. Believe it, you know. And I, I, this is my first time saying it here. That was one of the concerns my dad used to have with me speaking. You know, you what am I going to say? Right? <laughs> what so am I going to say? Because I I used to just you know, sp- you know I used to just you know, I used to be too transparent sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And he, you know, so we did a men's thing, and we were talking about um, you know the father son relationship, and after he we got off, he you know. Once again, this is my first time t- talking about this. After he got off, he said, "Thank you for be going easy on me." And I said, "Wow." The reality is, he knows that I'm privy to certain things about Doctor A. R. Bernard that a lot of people aren't. Right. And you know, one of his concerns was, was I going to you know talk about it? And I said, "No." Nah. I-, I said, "I said, I believe because my legacy is a part of your legacy. Yeah. I'm not going to do something to tarnish your legacy. Right. I, you know, and I said, and plus, I said, you're h- human. I said, not, not everybody is mature enough to understand the humanity of A.R. Bernard. Right. You know, they need just be past Bernard. So I said, yeah. I would never do that to you. But uh, it's crazy that that was one of his concerns. Yeah. It, and it's interesting because, you know, you talk about, you know, uh, the next generation and you talk about like the 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 conversations you have with your dad and and him being kind of like oh what is he gonna say uh when it comes to church culture mm-hmm. right uh, and i know this might be a loaded question right <laughs> um but let's talk about it right yeah. when it comes to church culture in your opinion with us not being able to kind of like plan ahead or, or just seeing what we what we can only see or, mm-hmm. or working with what we can only see. What's wrong with the current church culture that we do have? Oh, man, there's a lot wrong with the church culture. I said it was the a loaded church. question. No. My bad. <laughs> Think about it. You know, it, 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 it. We're so polarized right now, whether it's political uh, polarization, you know, um, you know, the abortion issue, the... Uh, the same sex, you know, uh, uh, issue. You know, it, there's so many things that's pulling us apart. We're we're not we're divided. That's the biggest problem. Yeah. The biggest problem with church culture is we are we are divided, and a divided house cannot stand strong. Yeah. Right. And that's what we are. We're a divided house. And the the, the other problem with church culture is that they have watered down and um, went to an extreme on certain messages and has hurt us. Yeah. Right. So like like I think one of the biggest things that has hurt us in the twentieth, you know, in, in in the twentieth century, twenty first century I should say, is the hyper grace. Right. So that says, you know, people can live a certain way, you know, but, but there was no balance between grace and truth. Mm. Right. The grace is I'm, I'm gonna love you through holding you accountable. Yeah. Right. And how do we how does that look? And we went to such a hyper grace where we elevated grace and the institution of church, and we didn't elevate the the life and the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? So, hey, church is, has grown up higher than the life of Jesus Christ. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that are plaguing us, the polarization, the the hyper, uh, whatever, hyper you know, prosperity, hyper grace, whatever went to the extreme has hurt us. Uh, yeah. The word of faith movement has just a history of hurting us. Yeah. Where we, you know, why can't we go back to the gospel, lo- preaching this 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 Jesus Christ and really 
rethinking yeah. our strategies and our methods on how we reach, reach the people. Because all over the globe, they're laughing at the Church of America. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I, I've never really talked about this publicly, but for me, the church has hurt me tremendously. Um, and and it's not it's not pushed away my belief in God, but my trust in the church has has been shaky, right? Um, and now now where I'm at in in my, it's almost like I'm not trying to be an anti-hero, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I think where where the hurt has pushed me is to be not that. Yeah. Right? You know, still believe what I believe, mm -hmm. but not take that approach, right? Um just because I I never want to <laughs> And I guess this is maybe my my young mindset, right? Because or my old mindset. I'm much older than you, you know. But <laughs> but I I refuse to sit at a table with pastors just because I want to sit at a table with with the people I can actually learn from, mm -hmm. where the hurt is coming from, mm -hmm. where where the change needs to happen. You know, I feel like I'm not going to learn anything over there. I'm going to learn over here, and I just don't know if that's because my mind has kind of shaped or warped because of the hurt. Um, but I do feel like, uh, it, it, you could push back or we can kind of talk about it, but I do feel like the church lacks so much empathy for the community and for people. But I don't know why that is. Well, when you say the church, you, you, you're, that's pretty generic. Are, are you talking about a particular church or are you talking about the body? Well, I'm not going to talk about a particular church. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about a particular church. But I, I just feel like, I, I I I would agree with you. And, and, all right. So being a little more transparent, right? A lot of people I do meet, you know, it's really hard for me to recommend a church to someone mm -hmm. because I don't know if that pastor is really going to take care of that person and their family mm -hmm. the way they should be shepherded, yeah. you know, loved on and stuff like that. Like I find myself like, you know, I could probably... For in, in my my worldview, there's probably like three, four churches that I'm actually going to recommend somebody to. But how many churches are there in New York City? You know yeah, what I mean? Right. At this point, so uh, and it's because the more conversations I do have with like pastors and leaders and stuff like that, the I just don't know if it's because of the the church culture bubble or the lack of empathy for people. But I feel like sometimes I also tell myself at the same time. I do find myself going more than other people, right? To kind of love on people and, and and be a part of someone's life and and share with someone. Um, I get bothered when I guess other people aren't that way or aren't mm. naturally that way or they struggle to be that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it in in this field that I'm in, right? I don't want to call it a field, but this area, right? I do find a lot of pastors who do come to me and say, hey, man, help me with my community. And even though I say, wow, okay, yeah, you know, I have no problem helping you. I do feel sad because we, how do you, f like, it's, I don't think it's that hard to love on someone, you know? Yeah, well, remember, going back to the whole statement of mental health, right? There's a lot of pastors in the pulpit that's dealing with trauma. Right. There's a lot, of, a lot of pastors that you know that dealing with you know unhealthy you know um, mindsets, even though you know guys to them, they're preaching stuff like that, and some of them don't. They really don't know how to love on people. Yeah. There's a lot of pastors I can tell you that do not know how to like even for, like look at my dad. My dad went through a process of uh, learning how to love us because he was intentional about that. Mm. So we hugged each other. You know, we, you know, he he would give us a kiss on the cheek and stuff like that. Where you got a lot of a lot of Pastors in the pulpit that don't know how to even love their own kids pr correctly, let yeah. alone love the community. Yeah, you know, and I I do agree with you. I think there is uh, you know a, a level of empathy, um, you know, from the different churches, and that's why I love about COVID. COVID is like okay, you know, it, it kicked us out of the building, you know, because yeah. the, the idea is if you didn't come to the building, you weren't a part of the, the church community. Yeah, right. But my dad taught us. He said, you know, the, the, one of the the metrics for success of a church is. Uh, how relevant it is to this community, you know. With if your church closed, would the community miss you? Yeah. 
And if most of the community is saying, no, they wouldn't miss you, then you're not doing an effective job. Because one of the things that God has called us to do is be an effective agent of change within the community, not just inside the building. Yeah. And I think, you know, so uh, so I think, you know, between trauma, uh, you know, uh, the other thing is in, in, in theology school, we, we're not taught, you're not really taught experience uh, yeah. uh, you know yeah. that you know so like nyack I, I loved and appreciate nyack alliance theological when i was going there because they actually had an urban engagement component yeah so how you know and we were, we read books from like john perkins and stuff like that we you know we had classes where we had to learn uh you know um how to engage the community especially yeah. if you're in an urban environment but the most the majority of your theolo- theologians and theological uh seminaries are not teaching that. Yeah. Right. So now you're pastoring, you're called to this community, but yet you're not taught how to engage the community. Right. Uh that's you know, so that's another thing. I think also is a, a lack of ingenuity and creativity, right? Because you know, you got you got these pastors like my dad, he's a he's an introvert. But he was of the mindset, I don't have to do it. Let me, I got people in my my church that have a passion and heart for the community. Right. We just empower them, right? Or you have, you know, you know, there's programs, there's another church doing what we can't do. We don't know how to do it. How can we come alongside of them and not yeah. lose our identity? But you have to be secure as a church and as a pastor yeah. in order to do that, right? So hit, Sandy hit, right? And once again, mental health, right? Because part of your insecurities uh, is a part of your, your mental health. So if you're not a secure pastor, a secure leader, you're going to have a hard time working with organizations that are being successful that you can come alongside to affect your community, Yeah. right? Uh, because, you know, I don't get the, the credit. I don't, you know, and is it about credit or is it about lives, right? Is it about souls? And, um, you know, and some people say, well, Pastor Jamal, you can say that uh, because you're a big church. No, this is the stuff that we were doing when we were a small church. We just did it at a greater level yeah. as we got bigger. Right, so this is not something we decided to do now. No, this is a part of our character. This is who we are as a ministry, CCC. We have to affect the community that we're in, right? right? And to the point where when we left um, uh, Manhattan Avenue, Greenpoint, people missed us in that community. Manhattan Avenue, Greenpoint. Right? People missed us in that community. Yeah. When we left, uh, the, we, we, when our church we moved from Brownsville to East New York, people missed us in that community. There was a hard time with the let, letting us go out of the community. The people had a hard time letting us go. So it wasn't just because we had a large church. It was happening at every community we were in. Right. So, you know, you got you got insecurities, you got all this stuff. And then, so we were in, you know, Sandy Hit. New York was devastated. We have members all over. We're a large church, as you said. Uh, and there's a couple of churches that were uh, in our the community where our people were. And we said, instead of trying to go to the community, set up a tent, and we serve our people, why not empower the churches that are in there? Mm. So what, what did we do? We got generators. Send them to the churches. Say, hey, look, we want to empower you to respond to your community. Not only do we want to uh, empower you uh, with the generator, we're going to use you as a food bank for distribution, yeah. so you can respond to our, our, our community. And we're going to put your, your your name on our website to let our people know where they can go to to because going from far Rockaway to to Brooklyn. If you you know growing up in Brooklyn, you know far Rockaway is far. Right, and it's only two main areas come out. You can go down, you know, Cross Bell. You can go down on Flatbush Ave. Right, so, um, and we started saying, let's empower these churches. Right, but we were able to do that because we were secure, uh, and, and and know who we are and what we do. Yeah, right. God has called certain people to our church, and we're, we're securing that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Dropping gems. I'm happy you said some things too, because if I would have said it, forget it. Uh, no, but no, that's good. No, I, I definitely. I definitely uh, agree, man. Um, you know, again, man, I, I think you're you're such a breath of fresh air when it comes to just how your mentality is, right? And how you see people and how you see the community, but how you still, you know, stay to to your core of who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kind of like shifting a bit and and now transitioning back into you back to you. Man, what makes you want to be better? What makes you want to be a better pastor, father, you know, husband? Like, what are some of the things that I guess drives you to continue to to just be better for your community? For you know, I, you know growing up, I'm, I play sports stuff like that, and what I realized, I'm very competitive, right? So I just had a strive, a hunger to just be better, yeah. right? I would practice. I'd be outside practicing, you know, to a point where, like I said, my first time playing organized sports football was a freshman. Yeah. By my sophomore year in high school, I was on varsity. Okay. Right? So I, I, right, I had schools coming to look at me. 
But I was out there practicing, running drills, learning. I was studying, reading the playbook, you know, memorizing certain things because I wanted to be the best. I didn't want anybody to have the possibility of taking my spot. Right. Right? So when it comes to life, I want to be the best father because I don't want anybody to have the possibility of taking my spot. Hmm. I want to be the best husband because I don't want anybody to have the possibility of taking my spot. I want to be the best pastor, you know, because uh, I don't want anybody taking my spot. And I think that's what drives me. It might not be the best thing to think, but that's what drives me. Yeah. That's what pushes me to to continue, you know, uh, going on and, and doing uh, certain things where I don't settle. Like, my mind is always going, what can we do? How can we do it better? Yeah. Right? And even to the point where one of our timeless fundamentals at CCC is a relentless drive for progress, unyielding to mediocrity. And what, what we say is our, our best at one level becomes mediocre at the next level. Yeah. And what can I do to you know, now? I say what find my best. What's my best? So I'm always pushing because once again, my my and 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 this is where you know some of that therapy works. You know because at one point it used to be a fear that was driving it. Yeah. Where I didn't, I was afraid of somebody taking my spot. Where now I'm saying I just want to be the best because I just don't want nobody to take my. I'm not afraid of it anymore. It yeah. doesn't, doesn't hold me back. But back in the days, you know, before you know some of the therapy and stuff, I was. You know, it was, the fear was driving it, but now it's just competition. I just want to be the best. You yeah, know, this is, is I just rooted in the, healthy. Yeah, healthy, healthy competition. competition. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So, so from what you're saying right now, and and all that you've accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what is success for you? Uh, success for me, and 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 I think uh, I want to I want to I want to say I came up with this, but this uh, is my I got my dad credit. Success for me is a legacy. A proper legacy, right? And it's not uh, um, the legacy is not financial or material, right? Material is good, we, you know. We love, but that's at the bottom of the thing. You know, success for me is the in the in legacy is 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 a decision framework, yeah. right? I'm, I'm leaving a, a, a way for my kids to make good decisions, right? Mental health, right, uh, is part of the legacy. You know, make sure that you know I'm leaving a, a, a legacy of good mental health, spiritual health is a part of my legacy. You know, so to me, if I'm successful. A success to me is having a good legacy, and within that legacy, all of these, these things you know run the gamut uh, of what should happen within my legacy. What am I leaving to my kids? That's good. Uh, and uh, emotional health, mental health, spiritual health. Um, you know, like I said, decision matrix, and then you know, of, of course, f financially, what am I leaving with uh, for them? So that when I die. My kids are not worried about their kids. They're starting to build for their grandkids. Yeah. And good. to me, that's success. That's good. That's good. Listen, man, I appreciate you being on. I yeah, can, no, I, thank you. <laughs> it's been it's been really good, man. I, I I'm excited for people to see this and 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 you know, share how they feel and 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 I think one of the best parts of this part is that I love to really go and and talk to the people about episodes and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I have one more question for you before you know, and this is a question I ask everybody. Uh, it's my billboard question. It's important. <laughs> uh, if you had a billboard, uh, what would it say and where would you put it? All right. So is it a billboard about Jamar Bernard or is it just a billboard, like generic? Like we just, you, it's just throwing you, out there. You can put whatever you want on it. Yeah, I, I, I've had people put their, their, their company on it. And just mm -hmm. leave it like that. Some people put quotes on it, but it's your billboard. You could throw it anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. What would it say? It's your life. It's your legacy. What are you going to leave? No, let me, let me rephrase that. Go ahead. Let me rephrase that. I would put on the billboard, everybody leaves in a, a legacy. Whether it's intentional or unintentional, everybody leaves a legacy. Question is, what are you going to leave? Mm. Jamal, what does the next five years look like for you? Wow. Um, next five years, I want to really engage the community. I really, I, I really, I really want to just be able to really enjoy living a life of making a difference in people's lives. Mm. And not from the pulpit, right? That, that's gonna happen, you know, uh, that's a part of it. But really saying, you know, I, I wanna see people smiling again. Yeah. I wanna see people having fun again. Like like being being a Christian is fun, right? The, the Christian experience 
to me, is a best experience that speaks to ultimate reality. Yeah. Right? And if we can find having fun and doing that, that's my goal. So the next five years, I'm thinking of methods and ideas, systems, structures, that what, what we can do to really engage the community of believers to say, I'm a Christian, I'm having fun, right? You know, and 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 where I am today as a Christian, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Yeah. Because it's fun, yeah. right? You know, because I don't want it to be task driven. I don't want it to be burdensome. Christianity was never designed to be a burden of that, you know, at, at that idea, right? Because people try to be deep and say, well, you know, you know, Christ says carry this cross and stuff like that. No, but what he was saying was trade your burden for my burden because the burden I have for you is designed for you to carry. So even though it might be a burden, you can carry it. Right. Right. You're not going to struggle. Uh, you, you should struggle with the burden of Christianity. Right. Right. And I, I just want people to know that, you know, so my goal is to create content, create uh, books and um, just start really getting to get engage in the community believers say no we have to make this attractive yeah let's have fun with our Christianity yeah. when we make this attractive and authentic and we which you are showing change of growth right yeah then people are gonna want to come I said you, you evangelize with your lifestyle quicker than what you say out of your mouth yeah that's what I live by yep. yeah yeah man I appreciate you no I appreciate you uh, this was great. Uh, really, really thank you for having me. For, I mean, thank you for coming on, man. I feel like you had me on. It was, it was so good. This was no, your show. You, thank you for having uh, me. No, I'm man, enjoying it this. It was good. I really appreciate it. I'm actually, you. I'm, I, I want to get my calendar. I said, where's the next one? You know what? <laughs> You make it so easy to talk to you. Yeah, like yeah, oh, cool, like you, you got this vibe about you. I'm like, yo, you just, I just want to pour my heart out to yeah. you. You know, because so, <laughs> so I believe that you're authentically listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, Appreciate you got individuals you. that you talk to, but you, yeah, yeah. and they, they hear you. Yeah, but they're not always listening. And you are authentically listening. So thank you, my brother. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, so you much. man. Thank you, Angel, man. Papa. Thank yeah. you, <laughs> <laughs> guys. We see you next time. Peace. I've been checking the boxes, living off sordid dreams and losses, memories.